lift every voice and sing. Till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies. Of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise. High as the listening skies. Let it resound. Loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory, victory is won. Is won. Good evening. I'm Michael Granger, president of Cumberland's Black Law Students Association. I'd like to take this time to welcome you to the 27th annual Thurgood Marshall Symposium. Due to COVID restrictions, this year the symposium is 100% virtual, but we still hope to provide a rich and insightful experience for those in attendance. Now, the moderator for this year's symposium is going to be Denzel Okonedo, who is a 2019 Cumberland graduate and was also SBA president of Cumberland School of Law. So with that being said, again, we welcome you, thank you for joining us, and Denzel, take it away. Thank you, Michael, and thank you so much for tuning in into this year's Thurgood Marshall Symposium. My name is Denzel Okinado, and I'm an attorney at Burr Foreman in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, I'm excited and I'm honored to be this year's Thurgood Marshall Symposium moderator. Um, more so for the fact that we have so many people who have so much knowledge, experience, and respect um, among their communities and their peers, uh, but also because every person on this panel has affected my life and the life of the other young African-American attorneys, um, either directly or tangentially. Um, so I'm excited to introduce them today. So we will start out by introducing the Honorable Sybil Cleveland, who is a graduate of Cumberland's class of 1990 and a municipal judge for the city of Huntsville. Next, we have Courtney French, who is a graduate of Cumberland's class of 1998 and a senior partner at Petway, French and Ford. We also have Sarah Williams, who is a graduate of Cumberland's class of 2006 and managing attorney of Alexander Shannara trial attorneys. And last but not least, we have Leon Hampton, who is a graduate of Cumberland's class of 2013 and a partner at the Beasley Allen Law Firm. So thank you everyone for being a part of this panel. Um, you all have great respect and great influence in your community. You've all done great things in itself, both in the realm of law and outside of law. And let's kick off our conversation. I want to reference a quote by Maya Angelou, where she said that we delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it's gone through to achieve its beauty. Everyone here has very clearly experienced successes in their own right. Uh, but let's talk about before you got here. So starting with you, Judge. Before law school, what attracted you to the legal profession? Well, my experience actually, uh, or my uh, journey to the legal profession started back when I was in high school. I can't ever remember wanting to seriously do anything else other than to engage um, in some way in the legal profession. Uh, I'm a little older than most of you on this panel. I, I, I grew up um, at a time, I mean, shortly after, after the passing of Brown versus uh, Board of Education, uh, my first year of elementary school, I actually went to um, uh, a segregated school. It was the last year that school would be segregated, and I was moved over to the predominantly white schools that were integrated uh, after that. So it was always a challenge to uh, uh, perform and to show and you know that you were just as worthy just as good as your as your counterparts people that looked like me didn't make it into the into law school they didn't you know they, they didn't even strive to go to law school back at, at you know during the that day 
uh, and they, they they certainly uh, didn't think about you know, making or having simple ac accomplishments like being on the National Honor Society. So I had to work really hard in high school. So I wanted to do something with my life that I knew in some way would impact others. I wanted to be a part of leveling the playing field to make uh, um, uh, opportunity possible for all people, regardless of their backgrounds or their walks in, in life. So I, I decided I wanted to go to law school way back then. And Sarah, Leon, and Courtney, feel free to chime in. Well, I'll just say, uh, uh, Denzel, thank you for, for having us on. And uh, thank you, Courtney, for uh, the invitation as well. Um, it's, it's an honor to be on this this panel uh, with all of these great uh, guests that you have here. Uh, I, I'm, I grew up here in Birmingham, uh, went to uh, high school here and college here. Um, but back, uh, similar as, as the judge said, back during uh, really junior high and high school days, I was very much uh, involved with my student council uh, and my student government association. Um, and I started learning about how uh, at that point in time, how uh, certain areas and certain professions were making an impact. Um, and a lot of us are familiar with the career days that where you, um, you have different professionals that come to your school and talk about what it's like to be uh, in their career path. And I remember having uh, an attorney come to my school, my high school. Um, I, I, I didn't know an attorney personally. Um, no one uh, in my family had ever gone to law school. Um, my parents were first generation, uh, were the first generation to actually finish college. My grandmother before them, I mean, made it as, as high as the sixth grade. And so, I mean, this was like something like nobody in my family had ever done. But I had people around me uh, who really pushed me and, and a very uh, close knit and tight community about if, if you wanted to make a difference in your community, um, you know, law school was a great way to go. Uh, and, and much of my practice has been centered around uh, trying to, to represent family and individuals and uh, change policy for the better. Um, and, and so that's really sort of my, my story of how I got involved uh, uh, and it sort of put me on the career path to law school. My, my background and my degree from college was in, in education um, and, and so I even was able to use some of that where I would, uh, uh serve as an adjunct professor from time to time at, at a, at a law school, but it's been uh, a great experience so far. I'll go ahead and jump in. So I, um, did not choose to go to law school for lofty reasons. And people are often shocked by that. Um, now that I am older, my friends and, and one thing that's great about social media, I'm an army brat and I have the opportunity to connect with so many friends from elementary school and middle school. And so they tell me, you know, you always said you were going to be a lawyer. But I think um, when I went to high school, I got a little lost um, in terms of like my identity and who I was. And so my college counselor, you know, I was an English lit major. I love to read. I love to write. Um, but I didn't really like little kids. And she said, look, you're either going to be a teacher or you're going to go to law school. But, you know, this is your skill set. Um, and so I, I applied to law school because I knew that I was not really great with little kids and didn't want to teach English. Um, and so I really found myself at Cumberland and found myself in the trial advocacy program there um, and really was grounded um, by being mentored by just great lawyers, um, great alum from Cumberland. And so, you know, it was such a blessing to, to go. But um, that I know there's probably someone out there who's watching who was probably a little lost like me. And so I don't confess that often. Um, but I've been preaching vulnerability. And so I, I decided I would share that with y'all. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, the invitation to be a part of this, this panel. You know, my journey to law school was a little different. Um, I grew up in Choctaw County, Alabama. That's West Alabama. Went to Alabama a &M University and majored in secondary education with a concentration in social sciences. 
Um, my goal was to be a teacher. I wanted to be a teacher, go back to Choctaw County, uh, get my master's degree in education administration and become the principal. And my third year of law school, a, a third year of undergrad, a series of events happened that kind of led me to law school. So our social science department was engaging in this lecture series, this book and lecture series. And one of the books that we read was The Arc of Justice by Kevin Boyle. And, you know, I, I won't go into the details uh, about the book, but ultimately lawyers played a, a significant role in getting this doctor um, acquitted off of a murder charge back in the 1920s. Um, and so that, that was one thing that, that stood out to me. And then Doug Jones came to a &M and he gave a lecture on his role in prosecuting the bombers of the 16th Street Baptist Church. And after that lecture, I, I just saw how much good you can do uh, by being a lawyer, by, by you know, uh, listening, to someone, listening to someone plight and then using your skill set to help bring justice um, to their family. So after that lecture, I start, started researching law school and ended up at Cumberland. For everyone in your time at Cumberland, did you find that there's some sort of support system that helped you out, whether that was faith, family? Sarah, you mentioned the trial team was kind of where you found your identity um, and your support group. What are the things that kind of helped you throughout the time in law school? So for me, I am a transplant. I'm from Tallahassee, Florida. I moved to Birmingham just to attend Cumberland. And I was coming from Florida State. So I, I came from this huge university. Um, and it was somewhat of a culture shock. But, you know, back then, um, Denzel, I feel like I say this all the time. You all are spoiled. There were four, well, six black students in my class um, and in each class. And so Balsa was a very tight knit group. We had soul food Sundays. I mean, we were family. Uh, you know, we didn't always agree, but we were definitely family. And, um, you know, the folks who were in my Balsa chapter during that time period are some of my closest friends now. I still lean on them, um, especially during this pandemic. We educated our children together. And so, you know, I give a lot of credence to, you know, the trial ad program for my skill set. But in terms of support and getting me through law school and beyond, um, I would not have survived it without my Balsa chapter. And, and so, Denzel, I, since I was from Birmingham, I, you know, uh, it was a little different for me. Uh, I went to college less than 10 miles away at Birmingham Southern College. Uh, so there were many students in my, my first year class uh, who also went to college with me. And being from Birmingham, I still had a sort of a built in support with family, uh, not being too far away. Uh, but uh, when I started uh, at Cumberland in 1995, we had 17 black students uh, in my first year class. Uh, we had 17 and I think that was one of the largest. I'm not sure what the numbers have been since then, but we had 17. And uh, as, as Sarah mentioned, uh, you know, we were just automatically family uh, from day one. Uh, you know, we studied together, we ate together because we had so many different things that were already in common. Um, and then also uh, many of the professors at that time um, also uh, we felt that we could kind of talk with and, and share things with. Uh, and if we needed someone to, to talk to and talk through uh, items and issues with uh, many of the, the professors at that time, uh, would have an open door policy where we could go in and, and, sh and share that time with them. Uh, so that certainly made it uh, uh, a good feeling and a very inviting place to be. Well, um, my experience was very similar to, to Sarah's as well. Uh, I found a great deal of support from uh, my, uh, my, my friends, my family, but I, um, I believe when I started uh, Cumberland, there were five blacks in my class and I was looking at my composite today and I, we only graduated three out of five uh, in a class of a little over 200. But uh, Balsa was also like you all, Balsa was a big, big part of, uh, of our uh, camaraderie. And I just do not think without um, that family support that, that I, gain from Balsa. I don't, I don't think there's any way I would have made it through um, 
the way that I did. So, I mean, there are days that, you know, I would often feel like, you know, I don't know if I really belong here or, you know, this, the culture really didn't feel as though it was, you know, meant for me. Uh, not only was I black, I was a female at that time. There weren't very many females who were uh, in my class. So, uh, yes, I mean, I, the, the support on campus was tremendous. Yeah, so I came from Alabama A&M, as I stated earlier, and that's a historical black college. And so you can imagine the culture shock that that uh, was waiting for me once I got to Kamala. Um you know, my father lived in Birmingham. I had family close to Birmingham, so I certainly depended on family a lot. But just like everyone um, has said, Balsa was just indispensable. Uh, we had about six um, African Americans in my graduating class, so we were a very tight knit group. And then the other thing is just faith was huge for me. Um, I, there were times in law school that I put everything on pause, like on Wednesday nights, and. Bible study was a must. It, it wasn't optional, you know, so I, I had to make sure that I, I kept that at the forefront just to get through it. And I knew that if I, if I kept those support systems around me, that I could pretty much conquer anything that was in front of me. Judge, you said something earlier about how, you know, you were just coming in age when Brown versus Board had just passed. Um, fast forward to you're about to enter the legal market. You're, you're a 3L at Cumberland. Um, and it goes for the rest of you as well. What was the legal market like for uh, an attorney of color back then in terms of the hiring process, what you had to go to? Um, you know, for me, I'll, I'll, it, it's the typical OCIs, reach out to your connections. What was it like back then when there were just so few African-Americans being represented in the legal industry? Well, uh, back then, and as it is now, I'm sure internships were key. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, land an internship with uh, James Baker, who at the time was uh, uh, the city attorney for Birmingham, uh, a law student who was a 3L when I was a 1L, kind of took me under his wing. So he, he mentored me and helped me along the way and helped me to uh, network and, and gain uh, a little bit of um, exposure to others in the legal market in Birmingham. So I was able to get that internship, which I kept for two years. And um, I clerked during the summers. But when I graduated, um, the then city attorney uh, offered me a contract to be a special prosecutor. In addition to that, like you all, I had competed um, in the on the for the national trial team and was very much involved in the trial advocacy program and was on the trial advocacy board. So in during those competitions, of course, you would have legal professionals that would come to campus to judge those competitions. So I was offered a job by uh, one of the attorneys who is now a circuit judge in, well, in, in Birmingham, Clyde Jones, he offered me a job. So along with that contract, I went to work for, um, for Clyde and, and, and Houston Brown. And uh, I was their first associate and I worked under them and they've mentored me and they are a huge part of, uh, of why I am where I am today. I mean, I, I owe so much gratitude to both of those gentlemen. Yeah, so when I when I came out of law school, it was 2013. We had just gotten over the uh, recession. I think the recession had really hit the legal community really, really hard. And um, jobs were, of course, scarce for everybody, um, not just African-American students, but a lot of my classmates were having a, a difficult time um, finding a job. I had interned with Beasley Allen. I'd also interned with the Jefferson County District Attorney's Office. And I tried to keep up with my contacts in, in those areas. Um, and so the, I think the experience at the district attorney's office is what allowed me to land a job in Montgomery County District Attorney's Office. Um, but also it was networking with the, the, the contacts that I met at Beasley that um, also helped me land, land that job at, at the DA's office. So I think the contacts were key. Um, so, you know, I um, attended law school during, and I don't know if she was there when you were still there, Courtney, the dark days of career services at Cumberland when Jeanette Rader 
um, was a director of career services. And, you know, I, I think it's important to have very open conversations so that you, so some of you all know that, that that we've been through some things. And so we slotted just like, you know, you guys slot, except you guys slot, you know, now electronically. Um, but back then we had to actually go in and put our resume in a box. Um, and that resume did not often make it to the intended um, prospective employer. You know, I, I interviewed and eventually got jobs with firms that said, you know, we didn't get your resume first year. Um, but luckily, which is, I think it's so important, you know, when taking care of our own and, and, and supporting organizations, um, ALA had an amazing summer clerkship program. I try to always now hire a, an ALA summer clerk because I got my first job through that clerkship program um, with Beasley Allen and wrote a um, motion in limine um, for LeBaron Boone. They had a trial down in Lowndes County, um, a products case, and um, got to go and watch the trial. Um, but luckily, you know, was able to have that great reference so that the next summer, you know, I was able to obtain employment outside of OCI. Um, but, you know, back when I graduated, the big firms were hiring classes of 40 and 36. And, and so most people, it wasn't as difficult to find a job, I think, as it is now. Um, but I think for us, for people of color, it was it was a constant struggle. And so we still have still have to do the same things. And that's lean on our networks. Uh, yeah. So I graduated uh, Cumberland in 1998. Um, and kind of going back to your question, Denzel, about how much has changed. Uh, uh, I, I bet if you were to take a poll of, you know, the, the largest firms around uh, and see uh, and take a snapshot of how many black lawyers they had back when, you know, I finished or when, when Judge finished uh, in, the, in the mid 90s or late 90s, early 90s, and look at how many uh, black lawyers whether associates or partners that those same firms have now, uh, my money will be on the fact that there are not many more. Uh, in fact, I know uh, at, at a lot of those firms because I know the folks that work there. Uh, there are less there there are less black lawyers now. At, I mean, these are the major firms again, like Sarah was just saying, who would hire twenty and thirty at a time and have that many summer associates. If, if you have two to three hundred attorneys in your firm. Um, and you can count um, the number of uh, black lawyers on one hand. Um, I, I think at a lot of the, the big firms across this state, that has not changed, unfortunately. <clears throat> and I, and I, as I was sitting listening to uh, how each of the panelists answered that question, you know, there, there seems to be a common denominator. Mine is when I graduated in, in 1998, I was offered a clerkship with uh, Ralph Cook, who was on the Alabama Supreme Court, uh, and Ralph Cook took me in. Uh, Judge Cleveland just said she was offered uh, a position with Judge, uh, I mean, who were attorneys then, but Houston Brown and Judge Clyde Jones, uh, other African-American attorneys. Um, Sarah and Lynn both said, talked about their experience with like either ALA, with us, which is a black legal association, and getting that opportunity uh, where they gave a stipend to firms that you know probably wouldn't have hired other black lawyers. That's how ALA summer position works. And Leon talked about Beasley Allen. Well, at that time, uh, one of the well, the first black partner at Beasley Allen was LeBaron Boone, and uh, he tells a, a story to all of his friends about when he first was offered the position in Montgomery at Beasley Allen, um, and this hadn't been too long ago. This is like in the '90s that the senior partners at, at that firm were a call and, and received calls throughout that city saying that you better not hire that, that N word to work at that firm. And if you do, we will never do business with you. Um, I mean, they were going to blackball the firm because they did not want a black lawyer <laughs> to work for, for that firm. Uh, and uh, to, to the credit of those who were in charge and making the decisions back then, you know, they hired uh, LeBaron Boone on and he's, he's obviously one of the top, top attorneys in this country. 
Um, but a lot of us have had the opportunities that we have because of the bridge that brought us over were, were other black attorneys, other black judges. Uh, and so, I mean, the title of, of this symposium to whom much is given, I mean, that's a, a great title because, I mean, that has been my my motto throughout my, my career, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. Uh, and so uh, as at, as my firm, we've hired uh, other uh, attorneys. You know, I've looked for uh, attorneys who've been, you know, of color or women underrepresented you know, to come in and, and, and they have all done an outstanding job. Um, but some of these other firms, you know, they they still lag behind, um, you know, of when it comes to having the diversity that we should. Courtney, I want to, and I'm interested to see what your response is. What's the importance of mentorships and, and not just the mentorships that you talk about with like, you know, a first year law student and a partner who's been practicing for like 20 years. Um, you know, I had some of the most impactful people in my life with people I was on the trial team with who were 3Ls when I was a, a 2L or I was, you know, I was a 3L and they were a first or second year. Um, and, you know, they kind of knew the things that I would be going through or things that I may not be able to um, grasp at the time. Um, so what's the importance of, of mentorships for you, whether it be the long term mentorship or even the one where they're a year or two older? Well, listen, I, I think mentorships are uh, critical. Um, you know, people, again, like Judge Cook uh, at the time who took me in and uh, it's so much that I learned, not just about law, but about life. And, uh, you know, as Sarah said, just really keeping it real. That's the way that he was with me all the time. Um, you know, when you have a good mentorship, I think you learn always at least two things, and that's what to do and what not to do. And, and that's important uh, for attorneys who don't really they don't have the, the advantage of being in big firms or having a lot of resources or in my case, being first generation. I didn't have a mother or father to kind of tell me about what the legal profession was like. I was having to feel my way through. But I had other people who had been down the road uh, like, you know, Judge Helen Shores Lee um, and, and others who would spend time with me and, and kind of tell me about uh, certain pitfalls, again, what to do and what not to do. So I, I think in have, having uh, mentorships are, are just critical. Um, and, you know, had I been at Cumberland and had a Sarah Williams as a trial coach or whatever, who knows where I'd be right now, you know? Uh, but, you know, I, I didn't have that, op that, that opportunity. I mean, there was not a Sarah Williams in that position when I was there. Uh, but I mean, that is, that, that is very important. I'll say you also said something about looking for underrepresented minorities, whether they be people of color or they be women. Um, and you know, according to the ABA's ten-year trend in lawyer demographics, only five percent of all attorneys in the United States are black, and only a third of the attorneys in the United States are females. Um, so, Judge Cleveland and Sarah, it'd be I think it'd be very helpful to explain and share what has it been like being the sole voice in the room not only being the, the black person in the room, but the black female in the room. Well, I can speak to that. I, when I came to Huntsville, uh, I became only the second African-American to serve as a, as a judge. And it remained that way up until recent years. Uh, so I just became accustomed to that. You become accustomed to, uh, to uh, lending your voice and finding your voice uh, you don't shy away or back down just because uh, you're a part of something where the majority of the people involved don't necessarily look like you. So uh, I think probably uh, some of the um, inroads that I've been able to, to make, such as I uh, just recently completed uh, serving a term as the first uh, African-American as um, uh, president of the Alabama Municipal Judges Association. Uh, and and that, was, that was huge because, first of all, municipal courts have such a direct effect on people and their daily lives. Uh, a lot of the unrest that you hear throughout the country uh, has occurred simply because you have your local courts who are primarily operating as police officer court. So becoming president of that association and being on that board for years leading up to my presidency really gave me an opportunity to kind of uh, kind of 
spread that message and influence how other courts uh, are, are operating in the state. I uh, started a mental health court program uh, in my court back in 2004. Municipal judges thought I was crazy. I mean, they thought, come on, we're revenue generators. I know. I'm, and I said, no, we're, we're here to do justice. And, uh, and, and doing justice means doing what's right by all people and <laughs> collecting revenue, locking people in, up in jail is not always the just thing to do. So when I started that program, I had no idea that it would take on the life that it did uh, and become this reform movement within court systems. So as president of the association, I was able to help a lot of other courts implement and develop their programs and policies and in courts. And now we've gone from having mental health courts, we've got drug courts, I run a veterans court, a jail diversion court, while I'm diverting people out of jail into community corrections and, and uh, uh, syncing them up with jobs, opportunity, primary health care in some instances. And so these positions are, 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 are important and we can't as women shy away from leadership roles simply because we're women and because we're black. Um, I absolutely agree. I, um, you know, two things have been important for me um, in terms of my growth and that's been mentors. And, you know, I consider, you know, anyone who's had any influence over my career as a mentor, Courtney and his wife, Judge Elizabeth French were tremendous mentors for us in law school. I will never forget. And you may have forgotten, Courtney, but we were at a um, fundraising event that I had to attend because I was chief judge of the trial board at that time. And, you know, one of the donors was not, was a little tipsy and came up to me and was like shaking me and telling me how I look like Queen Latifah. And you and Judge French were walking away, but she turned around and came back. And she said in front of this woman, you do not have to allow people to speak to you that way, Sarah, just because you are a law student. And I carried that lesson with me throughout my career. And so, and you know, partners at my previous firms will tell you, like, I've never been afraid to say what I feel and what I think may be an injustice. And I've also never been, been afraid to get my hands dirty and do the work to change it. Right. And, and to, you know, if I, if, if they are not giving people opportunities to speak, I, I will volunteer to do the work. But um, I think that having the support of mentors, it's almost like you draw on that strength of, of those folks. Um, and, and so it has been, it has been a not always smooth ride. It is um, difficult to lead a large organization where most of the, the lawyers, you know, do not look like you um, and do not always appreciate, you know, um, your leadership. And it, it has been difficult, but I, I, there were times where I thought to myself, eh. and, and as y'all know, I stepped down in, in December of 2020 to continue to um, litigate more and kind of brand myself separately. But prior to that, I thought it was important to continue doing that work because I thought it was important for those coming behind me to see someone in that position. Like I knew success was attainable because I, I saw LeBaron, I saw Courtney, I saw Navan, right? I, 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 Tamula yelling, like I saw these successful black lawyers in it. So it's like, okay, it may be hard, but it is not something that is unachievable. And so I think that it's important, you know, when you are in those positions of leadership to like Judge Cleveland said, to accept them, but also to be visible while you are in them so that people, those coming behind us can see you in those positions and know, look, you know, this is something that is absolutely attainable for you. If it is attainable for this girl from Tallahassee, Florida, um, almost anyone can do it. I think that's, I mean, extremely powerful. One of the things that for me, when I was in law school, and even to this day, as a, a second year associate, um, and you've all touched it a, a little bit, is sometimes I'll be, whether I'm doing work or I'm in a big group, 
Um, you know, we've all worked hard to get where we are, um, but sometimes we let that little voice in the back of our head creep in and that imposter syndrome comes. Um, and that's something that I've talked to a lot of my friends and a lot of people younger than me that is pretty prevalent in the younger society. And I was reading a New York Times article before this that said that not only does everyone deal with imposter syndrome, but minorities actually sometimes will deal with it to an, a, a more extreme ex extent. Um, when they're the one person that looks like themselves in that room. So kind of expanding the question that I, I sent through Judge and Sarah, um, Courtney and Leon, have you ever dealt with these bouts of imposter syndrome? Um, and, and what do you keep your, or say to yourself to stay motivated and not let those doubts creep in and affect your work and your goals? Yeah, for sure. I, I think all of us at some point has dealt with, you know, the imposter syndrome. It's where you are in an environment and you feel like you really don't belong to be there. Um, but for me, I look at all of the past successes and I look at all of the things that I've been able to um, overcome and say, you know, I, I got through those things because of my talent, because of my hard work, <clears throat> not simply because somebody knew me, not because, you know, they needed a black face, but because I worked hard. You know, I worked hard and I put in the work and I did what it take to um, succeed. Um, and and I, I want to kind of dovetail the, this answer into the, the question about mentorship. You know, Larry Ghostin at Beasley Allen has just been, I mean, he's been golden in my career. And one of the things that he's done to help me get over this imposter syndrome is to put me in environments and force a workload on me that even other people in the firm says, that's too much for a younger attorney. We had a, a very complex case in, in federal court back in 2018. I had been at the firm all, all of seven months. And it was a key TAM case on the False Claim Act, very complex facts. And we got ready to divide up the work for trial. And so Larry is going down the list and he's, I keep noticing that he keep putting my name by things, you know. So I have opening statement, I have, you know, cross examination of the, the main witness, I have cross examination of, of two other witnesses, I have closing arguments. And what he did for me is to allow me to see that, hey man, you can do this. Like you've been trying case in, in the DA's office for four years. This is your opportunity to not only show other people, but to show yourself that um, you're well capable of, of doing it. And when I finished, we finished that trial, it just reinforced in my mind that I'm there because I have the ability to get the job done and succeed. So I think to overcome this, you know, this imposter syndrome, I think you have to just keep looking back at all of the old accomplishments and seeing what you have gone through and know that you're there because you can get the job done. Yeah, absolutely, Denzel. I mean, I've, I mean, who hasn't had, you know, imposter syndrome? I, I, but I remember something that, that Judge Ralph Cook told me, um, you know, years ago, um, and he, he said that, you know, for, for most of our counterparts, uh, 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 white attorneys are our profession. Um, he said, and this is the analogy that he gave. He said, it's like they have a GED when it comes to what it's like to be black. But we have to have a PhD uh, in what it's like to be, quote, white in a, in a professional sense, in a cultural sense, in every other, other sense. Um, and, and have to be able to navigate between those two worlds. And, but he said, and, and I think you look at yourself, Denzel, at your firm, um, and I'm not sure how many, you know, African-American attorneys you have there now, but, you know, there's so much that you bring to the table um, by being Denzel and, and where you come from that's extremely different than the majority of the, the members who are at your firm. And, and when he kind of put it in, into perspective, like now don't look at it like you're going in being uh, less than or inferior or whatever. Look at what you're bringing to the table, you know. Um, and, and so I've always kind of looked at it from that perspective um, when, uh, you know, as I'm having these conversations, I, you know, I, I grew up here in Birmingham uh, and it, it's just certain communities that I know and I know the people in those communities that even my 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 law partners they, they just don't have those same connections I think also now we're in in Jefferson County in particular you know we've seen this shift uh, with our bench 
uh, on the circuit court level and, and the district court level. Um, and it's happened really more in Jefferson County and in Montgomery County um, to where you have more African-American uh, men and women who are on the bench. And, and you, you now, if I'm uh, a, a partner or a decision maker at a, at a big firm, it seems to me that's something that should go into their thought process about someone who has those kind of relations with those judges uh, as well. Um, you know, there again, there was a time when when the bench didn't didn't look like it, it did now. Um, so obviously we didn't know those judges as well. But now if you're going to church with with those judges and and, and having other social settings where you're seeing those judges, you're more comfortable with, with them in, in the courtroom. Uh, and I think that's an opportunity for firms uh, to to look at a positive of, of uh, hiring more minority attorneys, uh, again, not because they're black, but because they're good at what they do. Uh, and, and I think the old saying is true. I mean, we, we have to be twice as good in order just to even try to get a fair shake at things. And, and so I think that's that still holds true. Do you, any of you, and, and this is for the whole panel, do any of you sometimes feel that you're living in two worlds? Because I know a lot of you are in very corporate, very professional um, atmospheres. A lot of you are doing things outside of law um, that are really great, but, you know, kind of like you've all mentioned, you're in groups that don't necessarily look like you or represent what you may represent. Um, so do you ever feel like you're in two worlds and does it ever get stressful? How do you navigate going back and forth? Um, that, that's open to everyone. So I don't believe in living in two worlds. I, I am. Um, I think that you have to. I love the Jay-Z interview that he did at Columbia where he says, I walk into every room as myself. Right. And so I try to take that attitude with me. I walk into every room as myself. I am. And I struggled a lot with, you know, when you're an army brat, like you you don't really have an accent. You, you, I went to, back to Tallahassee for high school, but ha wasn't really from there. I'm a nerd, but I like football. Like there are so many things about me, but I embrace all of those things. And every room I walk into, I walk into that room as as that person. And and my diction isn't always perfect, right? When I'm trying cases, it is not either, you know, and sometimes it, it, it's, it's great and sometimes it's not, but I am who I am. And I think that what I have found from trying cases from the top of the state to the bottom of the state, that juries, irrespective of your race, respond to authenticity. And so I think if you, you try to live and code switch and, and try to live up to an image that you expect people to have of you, you're not being true to yourself. And people see that. They see that you're not being authentic. And that's, that, that's off-putting. And I think it is one reason, unfortunately, why you know lawyers don't succeed or don't survive at firms because you end up, it's stressful to have to show up for you know, 60 hours a week one way, and then you get to go home and, and be someone else, you know? And so I encourage, um, I absolutely encourage folks to just show up authentically. And if you are in a place that does not appreciate that, that place does not deserve your presence. You know, we have to start evaluating these firms as are they good environments for us? And if they are not, then they are not entitled to our presence there. And we have to remove ourselves from, from those situations. Well, I could not agree more with Sarah. I mean, I, I never really thought about the concept of walking in two worlds because I never thought about being anything other than my authentic self. Um, I feel that as a professional, as a wife, as a mother, if you're anything other than your than who you really are, the rest of the world is going to be able to pick up on that. So whether you are at a bar meeting with your colleagues or you're at your sorority meetings and your fraternity meetings, you, you should always take your true self into that room. Um, coming off as fake also makes you compromisable. It could also lend itself to your allowing yourself to compromise your values uh, when you're trying to live up to others. So um, 
I'm, you know, again, I, I don't think I've ever thought in terms um, other than just being who I am. Leon, I'd love to hear your Yeah, as I progress in my in my career, that that idea of living in two different worlds seems to dissipate. You know, as you get older, you start to become more comfortable with this idea of I am who I am, right? Um, I'm from Choctaw County. Like Sarah said, I have this southern accent. <laughs> um, you know, my, my grandfather was a preacher, my grandmother was a preacher. That's who I am. You know, I, I'm a minister myself. And so when I show up, that's that's what I know. And what I found out is that's really the value that you bring. You know, so when I'm talking to a jury in Montgomery County, you know, I'm used to standing in the pulpit and looking at old ladies. And I know when 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 they're with me <laughs> in the same way with a jury. I can tell if they're with me and I can tell if they're not buying. It. So so that's actually value, you know, but you have to grow into that. And so I would just admonish uh, the, the law students to get rid of this idea of twoness and become comfortable in, in your own skin. And what you'll find is that success will start coming to you because you realize who you are and you're comfortable. With it. Yeah. So um, I guess about three, three or four years ago, I was walking into um, uh, uh, and I'll tell you where I was. I was in the Shelby County courthouse going to Shelby County for a hearing. Um, and there, as you walk into the courthouse from the parking lot, the uh, the deputies, when you go through the metal detectors right there at the back door. Um, and and again, my counterparts, white attorneys, they were walking through, talking on their cell phones, had their files in the hand or legal pad. Um, and so I was as I was walking behind two or three of the guys who had gone in before me, you know, I had my cell phone with me and was going through and the, uh, the deputy, um, says, uh, I'm sorry, sir. You, you can't take your cell phone into the courthouse. Um, only attorneys are allowed to take their, their cell phones into the courthouse. And I said, well, and, and I'm dressed, like Leon is now, I look like a lawyer, you know, um, I had my brief bag, a file in my hand um, and, and my cell phone. And, and, and I would tell you, some of these guys were not, you know, I couldn't tell that they were lawyers. Um, but he says, well, I don't know you. Um, he says, show me your bar card. And I said, well, sir, I've been practicing law for, you know, almost 20 years at that time. Almost. I've been practicing now more than 20 I said, I don't I haven't carried my bar card since my first year of practicing law. Um, well, you know, if you don't show me your bar card, I'm not going to let you take that cell phone in there, you know, because I need proof that you are an attorney is what he says. And so, again, you know, I wasn't going to let this guy win the day. I, I walked back out to my car. I said, let me just see if I can find an old bar card, you know, lying around in my car. I, I went back to my car found a bar card, came back in and says, you know, here it is. He looks at it. He says, well, you know, this is expired. What I realized from that moment is it's not that any of us think that we have to navigate between these two worlds. It's how we are viewed. It's, it's how we are viewed. And, you know, here you have this guy in, in that position you know, and my, again, I was walking in the courtroom as a lawyer, like all the other folks, my colleagues. Imagine how embarrassing that is uh, to be stopped. But here this guy is um, and and he's even questioning whether or not, you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a lawyer because I don't look like the lawyers that he knows. I don't you know, I don't really fit the bill of what a lawyer looks like. And, and so, you know, I think that's just something for us to be aware of as and as, as not, again, us trying to change who we are. It's it's, you know, having that realization that in certain counties, when you walk into certain counties with your client, uh, with us as attorneys. And I will never forget when I was uh, uh, in first year towards class, uh, Professor Jill Evans um, did a hypothetical 
and uh, she she wore a, a dashiki uh, to class. And uh, I don't know if she still does this, but she says, you know, would this be malpractice uh, if you were representing a client in a courtroom to as as the attorney to go in uh, with the dashiki on? And, you know, and obviously everybody's like, oh, no, of course, you know, you, you know, you need to be who you are. But it again, it makes you think about the, the worlds and we've seen politically what has gone on around us and the disparity and treatment from medical to the prison reform to every other profession, th th those disparities. I mean, there there has to be a reason why, you know, these firms have not hired um, more black attorneys uh, than they have over the past 20 years. You know, here in, in, in Alabama, and I was having this conversation with someone about federal judges. I mean, here in 2021, where we've never had an African-American woman on the federal bench as a federal district court judge. I mean, that's, I mean, do we not have the Sarah Williams and the judge Cleveland's, I mean, who are qualified to be in those positions? Of course we do. But why, why is it that we don't have people like that, that look like us in those positions? And again, I think that kind of goes back to, to, you know, the, the disparities that we have that, that are just real disparities that we face in our profession. Courtney, you brought up politics a little while ago. One of the questions I wanted to ask, um, kind of deals with that. You were talking about COVID and the different inequalities that kind of go on stemming from you know, everything that started last March. Um, you know, this past year has been dramatically different. That's the fact that we're having the Thurgood Marshall Symposium on online instead of in person and getting to uh, commune and talk and meet and greet with each other. Um, you know, we have terms like social distancing, mask, um, stay at home, Zoom calls. That's a part of our everyday language. Um, but something else that became a part of our everyday language and conversation was topics of race and racial injustice. Um, and I, I think it's particularly interesting, especially since we have a judge here on the panel, a municipal judge, um, to ask, what is justice? You asked, you, you answered that earlier. Um, you define justice, but as an African-American who is in the legal profession and a profession that we're charged to always pursue the truth and justice, how what is that definition and how do we reconcile it with the things that we see on tv or in the news every day well i don't first of all when i think of justice uh, i don't think of of that being a concept that's applied differently to people because of the way they look or because of the size of their bank account um I think it's about doing just what is right. Do what is right by people. And when I when I think of the the position that I hold, I mean it's it's an awesome responsibility to think that every decision that you make is going to affect that person, but it's not going to just affect that person. It's going to affect a family and potentially generations. So the people who go on your benches and who become judges, not every lawyer is meant to be a judge. I know you all have probably said that a few times in your career. Every every lawyer shouldn't become a judge. OK, everybody's not 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 built for that. But you certainly want people who have the right temperament, who understand what are the qualities of a judge. Well, all you have to do is what is, all you have to think about is what is what what is just and what is fair. These are very simple concepts. You don't have to dress them up, but you have to believe that. And that's why integrity matters in a judge. Their character matters. Um, you don't want a judge who bends to the wind depending on if it's one of their golfing bot buddies who walk in the courtroom and they're going to offer more favorable rulings to that person versus another person that uh, a person of color that walks in the courtroom with their client. You, you, you want people who really and truly see that justice as being blind. So I know that's a, you know, that that's a lot, that, that's a wordy definition, but you know, I just believe that justice is doing what is right. Leon on Sarah, Courtney, I would love to hear you guys chime in as well. 
So I think justice is just fundamental fairness. Fundamental fairness without regards to race, without regard to um, sexual orientation, without regards to socioeconomic status. Um, there's a scripture that, that we all hear at these investitures that, that they talk about, you know, do justice, um, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And we hear that all the time. But just this past week, you know, I've been thinking, we often forget that first part is you do justice. You don't just talk about justice. Justice is not this concept that's, you know, esoteric concept that, that you, you talk about. It's something that you do. And so, for example, in, in Sarah, case when she's walking in front walk, walking into the courtroom and she gets stopped and her counterparts are there they see what's going on too so it's not just okay just to say you know that's wrong after the fact doing justice require you to speak up in the moment so so it's, it's not just okay to to feign as if you are an ally with words you have to step up in the moment and 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 do justice to people who in that moment is is um, not being shown justice. I don't know that I can add anything that um would improve on those definitions. I I, I do think that you know oftentimes um, because I feel like in 2020 I found myself embroiled in more discussions regarding um racial tensions, but more honest discussions. I felt like people, you know, asked me questions that they probably had been wanting to ask for a long time. And one of those was, you know, about um, the black community's defense of people who are often viewed as, you know, indefensible. You know, why are you defending you know, this particular person who is a criminal or whatever about their character. And that's the part I brought them back to. It's not about um, who they are. The system should deal with people for whatever crimes they have committed fairly. But that is the exact point. It is the system that 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 should be fair. And it is the process that should be fair. And we are not asking for special treatment. We are asking for equal treatment and have been asking for a very, very long time. Um, and, but I think that um, that is the thing that gets confused is that when we ask for equal treatment, it is viewed as us asking for something special. Um, and, and I just I think I think it's important to point out that fairness just means, you know, being equally treated or justice. Courtney and, and Sarah, I know you both have young kids. How do you talk to them about what's going on here? And Leon, I think you you, you have young kids as well. I mean, everybody chime in. Um, how do you talk to your kids at, at a young age about what they're seeing on TV in the past year? Um, and you know, and explain to them again what you do every day, going to court, pursuing this justice that we've all defined. Um, yeah, I think we just have to be uh, as as frank as we can uh, with our kids, uh, you know, on their level, uh, you know, truth be told, a lot of this stuff is hard for me to wrap my mind around. You know, uh, it's just to watch some of the things that have uh, unfolded over this past year in our country. Um, and, you know, even on my very street, I just found out over the weekend, you know, I, I have, you know, folks who were up in DC on January the 6th, <laughs> you know, uh, my neighbors uh, that that live on my very street. Um, and, and so, you know, you have to have these conversations just to make sure, uh, you know, kind of going what going back to what Leon said and taking a verse out of the Bible was to train up a child, you know, in the way that he or she uh, uh, should go. And and when they get old, they will not depart from it. Um, I think we just have to to continue to instill in them what is right. And not only instill that in uh, to to do right and allow them to witness it, um, and and the things that that really make a difference. You know, if if we're going to the polls, we're voting. You know, we take our kids with us. I mean, just other things serving the community. Our 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 kids are there, uh, and they see that it's not just talking about giving back, but actually, you know. You can start at any age, 
and so uh, with all three of our kids, we've tried to make sure that not only we, we instill, uh, you know, the, that concept of what's justice and giving back in them, but actually making sure that, that at their age now that they start and make that a part of who they are uh, uh, as kids. Um, and, and so um, I, I think that's that's going to be important. And, and they come home and they say, oh, you know, my friend said this at school about, you know, uh, something political or about the president. And, you know, you know, they've learned enough when I can just say, well, you know, what do you think about it? just to kind of check their oil every now and then to make sure that 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 moral compass is still, you know, headed in the right direction. And, um, you know, I think they 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 are learning again, to, like Sarah said, not just to to uh, say one thing, but to actually do it and, and speaking up. Uh, and, and I think that's important. So this year, um, these past couple of years have been been tough. I was Malone was. Um, still in preschool when Trump was elected. Um, and that is the first instance where it actually really affected her. I was driving home from school and she said, you know, mama, I don't want to be brown anymore. And I was, I had to pull over. Um, and I was like, you know, what's going on? And she said, well, one of her little friends who she had been in preschool with since they were babies said, we cannot be friends anymore. Peach people are friends with peach people and brown people our friends with brown people. And it really hurt my heart. Um, but I, I said, I try to live the life that I want so that, so that she can see the example. And I said, that is absolutely not true. So look at mama's friends. Mr. Hoven is mama's best friend. Miss Alyssa is mama's friend and they're peach. And then Miss Jennifer is mama's friend and she's brown. Look at mama's friends and think about all, we were just at, you know, Mr. Hoven's house. And she was like, yeah, that's right. What was, what was this girl talking about? Um, I'm happy to be brown. And, and I, I thought about that when, um, you know, stuff with George Floyd was going on last year. I had some close friends come in my office to talk to me about it and, and ask me, you know, you've been having conversations like this with your child. And I think for some people, it was the first time they had had conversations with their children about these issues. And I said, it is not enough to have conversations with your children about these issues. Like as close of friends as we are, I've never been to your house for dinner. You all have dinners with the lawyers in the firm, but y'all don't invite me. But you call me your friend and I feel like we're friends, but your children don't see that. So how can you say to your children, they have to love people who do not look like them when you do not show them that you also love people who do not look like you? And so I think um, I, I will say I, I actually had not planned on having children, but children will teach you a lot. <laughs> um, and the lessons that, that she has taught me, you know, in terms of dealing with these issues, um, ha have really helped me have those conversations, um, in a way that was not, um, that was loving, but direct. So we try to be very intentional about the images that we put in front of our daughter who was three and we have a son who. I'm not sure how much he knows he's in the world right now, but he's one. Um, but the, with the three-year-old, even with the books that, that she read or we read to her, um, we try to make sure that it's they're, they're brown, successful people as the characters, um, characters that have natural hair that look like hers. Uh, my wife had, have natural hair so that when she get older, hopefully the image in her head is, hey, this is normal. This is not me trying to be different, but this is normal. Um, but so we, we try on, on that front to, to try to be intentional about those images. You know, last summer, I think the, the climate had become so consuming, all consuming. And in our house, it's the only thing we were talking about between George Floyd, between the, you know, the, the political climate around June of, or July of last year. It's the only thing we were talking about. And my daughter is very intuitive. And apparently she was around while we were having a conversation. And so my wife is driving her to daycare. This is around July. And she's there having this conversation. And she says, you know, the police is going to get my brother. And so my wife picked up the phone and called me. And she's like, what have you been telling your daughter? And I had to explain to her, of course, I didn't. 
I didn't mention that to her, but she must have overheard a conversation that, that, you know, my wife and I was having. So that afternoon, as we went for our little walk around the neighborhood, um, one of the sheriff deputies was driving in the neighborhood. He happened to be African-American. I happened to know him from uh, my time at the DA's office. And I flagged him down, asked him to get out of his car. We, you know, fist bump to show her that, hey, the police are good people. And, and I actually told her, I said, this is a very nice guy. And he's here to help. Um, but but trying to dispel this idea that that police officers are inherently bad, you know, at an early age, you know, so at two or three years old, she shouldn't be having this notion that police officers are, are bad, you know. So I think, you know, combating the images that they may see that may be negative um, as it relates to African-American people and being being very intentional about the conversations that we have around them and as it relates to law enforcement or any other thing. Judge Cleveland, did you want to chime in? You may be on mute. Most of my co-panelists have very young kids. I have kids of all ages now. I'm, I um, don't know if, if uh, some of you may or may not know my daughter, Kayla, who is a third year at Cumberland now. And uh, so she's embarking on that next stage after graduation. Uh, and I have another daughter who just graduated from um, the University of Alabama. And I got married in 2019. So I have four stepchildren and I have two teenage boys, uh, 16 and 17. And um, so my husband and I, I mean, we are like you all, we are very, very frank and open and honest in our discussions about all things politics, all things uh, social issues. Uh, in fact, when our 17 year old went to get his driver's license, he put on a T-shirt and, 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 and we're like, no, you, that driver's license picture is going to project an image. It's not just a picture on a card. Uh, God forbid, if you get pulled over by law enforcement, one of the first things they're going to see is that driver's license. And you, you want to project a good impression even with that. And it's, it's a shame that we have to have those kinds of conversations with our children. You would wonder whether or not our counterparts are having those kind of conversations. But these are things that we as parents have to think about. And, uh, you know, I'm, a lot of you, your kids are young, but I can tell you, I mean, your, your, your thought processes, uh, I mean, it, it never stops. You continue to engage your kids, even when they become adults, because you, although you have done about as much as you can in terms of raising at that point, you still always want to come across as being yourself aware and engaged in the issues, but you also want to kind of gauge and see where they are because you want to, you know, you want to, you want to feel good that your that your kids are making good decisions, even when you're not around. Now, we've talked about kids. We've talked about the workplace. We've talked about law school before law school. Taking all this into account, would a young Judge Cleveland, a young Courtney, a young Sarah, a young Leon, would they look back or look forward and say, that is the person that I wanted to be. That was the person that I worked my butt off all the way up until today. And that is the person that I wanted to be. Leon, we'll start with you. You look ready to answer. Well, um, I, I think my story is, is still unfolding, of course. Um, I certainly believe that I'm, I'm on the right track. I don't know if someone can truly say they're successful until they get to the end of their life. You know, if they define success and, and stayed on that journey. Um, we know so many people who start on the right track and they get halfway in their life and, and go off rail. And so I think it's it's just a constant reminder to myself, you're doing well, but but you have to stay with it because a few bad decisions could could change the trajectory of your life. But um, as I look at my life right now, as I stand today, um, and I look back, you know, eight years ago, nine years ago when I was in law school, um, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm excited that, that I'm on the path that I am and um, I'm looking forward to the future. Uh, 
you know, um, doing what I do now, I, I love what I do. I mean, I, I genuinely love uh, what I do. Uh, I really couldn't imagine uh, any other profession being in any other profession. Um, you know, I'm certainly um, content with where I am, uh, but not satisfied to the point where I, I don't want to ever get to the point where I don't want to keep pushing harder and uh, making being more impactful. I think that's even important, too. Um, and so, uh, you know, with all of all of the, the co-panelists who I mean, who are very successful in their own right. Uh, and when people see, you know, all of us, you know, they think, oh, wow, look how successful they are. Uh, you know, uh, but the saying is true about an overnight success took years to make. And when you see, uh, you know, us doing what we do, you know, um, you, you don't see like the blood, sweat and tears and a lot of tears and a lot of tears uh, and uh, all nighters. Um, and I think we just have to be, you know, um, real with others. Uh, and especially students and those that, that we mentor uh, that, you know, if it was easy, it would already be done. Um, but, you know, there there are other um, hurdles, uh, even in our profession, uh, that uh, as African-Americans, we haven't crossed yet. Um, I know the, the new president, President Biden, says he's going to put an African-American woman on the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean, I'm looking forward to that, you know, um, and, and they're just other other, uh, I think, hurdles and glass ceilings that that need to be be broken um and you know i'm just kind of uh, glad to be a small part of of just just doing what i can uh to uh help push others and then also help to reach back and, and bring others along well um uh, as i think about uh where i've been where i am how i got here I mean, I'm I'm very grateful. I'm I'm I feel blessed to be a part of a profession like the legal profession where you can have so much influence on helping to make others lives better. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's you know, it's it's really about, you know, what did you do to impact uh, your community and your world? Did you do something to make it better? And that's one thing that I think a career in law does for, for all of us, whether we become judges on any level or whether we are attorneys. I mean, each one of us, you have that awesome opportunity every day that you wake up to go and, and, and make life better for someone else. Uh, and so with that, I would, you know, I, I feel very, very proud about having that opportunity to do that. Because when I was that little girl in high school, all those years ago, that's all I thought. I didn't know how I would do it as a lawyer. Never thought about becoming a judge. I couldn't even think past a lawyer. But I certainly am grateful and feel humbled and blessed to be in this awesome profession and uh, to be able to have an impact in some positive way on others. Um, so I often get asked, you know, do I regret not becoming a plaintiff's attorney sooner? Uh, as y'all know, I spent some years on the defense and I think about it and I, I, I'm a firm believer in, you know, seizing every opportunity to improve your skill set. And that's one of the things I love about being a lawyer um, is that there are so many different things you can pick up. And at every firm, every defense firm, I picked up a different skill set. They didn't know I would flip it and use it uh, against them. But I think back now, and I'm so glad that was my trajectory because, you know, we encounter people when they are in the worst moment. Um, it is a terrible time for folks, whether they have suffered a catastrophic injury or whether, you know, the car that they depended on to get them to work, to take care of their families has been totaled. And I don't think when I was a defense lawyer that I appreciated how significant um, these events could affect people. But the blessing is that I had the training and now I can use that training to help those folks in a way that I don't think I would have been able to had I just gone straight through. So I think 
you know, everyone's path is their path. I'm a firm believer in what is for you is for you. Um, and it, everyone's path is not going to be the same. You know, I, I think one of the things that continues to frustrate me is this um, emphasis on law firm, you know, defense firm life at, at law schools and career services. There are so many opportunities um, for you all, you know, you students who are listening that are out there. And so do not get discouraged if you don't get that big firm job. That it was not for you. I promise you, like whatever your path is, you're going to find it. And, and I did I ever expect my path to lead me to, you know, Alexander Shinar's office? No. Um, and then, you know, after last year, did I expect that, you know, I would step down and, and do what I'm doing now? Absolutely not. But I think, you know, I don't know what the future holds. You know, hopefully I'll look back and say the same exact thing that I'm so glad I made the decision to do X because now it has brought me to another place that I don't even know what that is. Um, but I know that I have the skill sets to to do whatever it is I need to do when I get there. Well, I appreciate everyone's time. I've, I've personally, I know I've learned a lot, so I'm sure that everybody who's watching has. And is it's kind of like a parting way? Would what was some advice that you would give a, a young law student, a young attorney like myself, um, as you know, we we start gearing up to be torchbearers and fall in steps with people like you um, who have paved the way. Are we starting with me? <laughs> um, I'll start. Um, I think, like I just said, I think it is important to figure out. So for me, I knew I wanted to try cases and where I, that was, I didn't care. Um, I did not know that I wanted or had a desire to do trucking until I got that experience. And so I would say two things to, to law students. One, don't close off or forego opportunities because you never know where you may find your passion. Um, who knew that I would like climbing under trucks? I'm, I'm you know, I'm kind of a prissy girl, um, but I love it, you know, and I never would have expected that, but I never would, if I had foreclosed that opportunity, I never would have learned that I had that passion. Um, the second thing is, um, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to walk into rooms where you don't know anyone um, and, and, you know, walk in them as yourself. You know, I, w I would advise um, the law students that are listening to not try to plan every detail um, not try to plan the next 20 years, but just be good at in the spaces that you occupy. You know, sometimes we try to figure out the next step and the step after that and the step after that. But if you just try to master whatever it is that you're doing, if, if you're a litigator, try to be the best litigator that exists. You know, if, you, if you're, you know, um, a transactional lawyer, try to write the best brief that exists. And what I've found is that as you do that, opportunities seem to just open up. And one thing will lead to the next and the next thing will lead to the next. And you get to a place where you say, you know, I didn't even see myself being here, but but I took the job that I had very seriously. I'll, I'll tell you a very quick story about how I got to Beasley Island. Yes, I did clerk with them, but that's not how I, I really got there. I was asked to do a mock trial for pre for minority pre-law uh, day in Montgomery. And two nights before the mock trial, I found out that I was going up against Kendall Dunks, who is a, an amazing trial lawyer. And the question was a product liability question, which is his specialization area. So I stayed up all night. I'm talking about I'm like up at three o'clock in the morning trying to master the facts because my goal was is just don't let them embarrass you. <laughs> so when I get to the mock trial, I mean, I put everything I could in it. And Larry Ghostin later told me that when he saw me trying to case this mock trial, he said, man, we got to get that guy over here. It was something as simple as a mock trial. But I, I tried to do the best that I could at it in that moment. And five years down the road, it led me to the job that, that I'm in now. So just be the best wherever you are and um, God will take care of the rest. 
So, so I would say um, by now, having gone through college and, 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 and law school, we all know that engaging with others is one of the ways that we are able to network ourselves from, from um, uh, one success to the next. Uh, being Living life in a vacuum is truly not uh, how you get ahead. I, you really need to engage and network with others. And that happens even after you become a lawyer or a judge. Uh, you will still want to continue to network even outside of your, prof your profession. Not only does it make you more appreciative of your own community, it makes you better at, uh, at, at, at what you do and what you ultimately bring uh, to, to your client or in cases of, of judges, what they bring to a courtroom. So uh, I, I certainly would encourage those that are listening to always be open to engagement. I don't think you ever, I don't think that ever ends. I mean, you want to be active and to be involved in your community so that it feels like it is your community. You feel like you, you have some stake in your community when you engage in it. So I would never stop doing that. You know, they call it the practice of law for a reason. Um, and we just have opportunity to kind of practice at it and, and you practice at it and, and to keep working towards it. Um, as Leon was talking about the story with Kendall, I thought about uh, the, the story about the farmer who went down to the racetrack and the farmer had a, a mule and he told the uh, the folks at the racetrack that he wanted to enter his mule into the into the contest with all the th the uh, thoroughbreds, and so uh, the farmer took his his mule and and the, all the thoroughbreds out on the track, and you know they blew the whistle, and, and those those uh, thoroughbreds they just took off, and uh, and that that mule just kind of hopped around the racetrack. And, and not surprisingly at all, the, the, the mule came in in last place. And uh, somebody looked to the farmer and said, you know, why, why in the world would you want to bring that old mule down to the racetrack and put him into the, uh, to the race with all these thoroughbreds? And, and the farmer looked at him and says, you know, he's a better mule just by being in the race with them that it actually made his game better. And I think, you know, we're not going to be the best at everything as a trial lawyer. Uh, you're not going to win every trial uh, as a plaintiff's lawyer, as a defense lawyer, the same thing. But even with the losses, you have to learn how to uh, learn from the losses. And some of my biggest lessons uh, in the practice of law uh, certainly have not been from my wins but, but have been from my losses. Uh, the same thing in law school. I, I mean, I, I don't forget how hard, how challenging uh, it was uh, during law school, especially that first year, um, you know, but I mean, stay in the race. You know, a lot of people are just afraid to get in the race. Uh, you will be better just by being in the race. And so, you know, that that's what I would just impart to, uh, to the law students. And I'll, I'll end with this. This last little quick story it was about a man who was traveling and it was dark outside and he was um, going to his destination and a voice came to him and said, stop and pick up the rocks and you'll be both glad and sorry. And, and the man refused to listen to what the voice was telling him. He, and he kept on going to his destination. It was so dark, he couldn't see anything. The voice came back again and said, stop, pick up the rocks and you will be both glad and sorry. But he refused to listen. He kept on going towards his destination in the dark and the voice came back a, a final time and said, stop, pick up the rocks and you will be both glad and sorry. And he just kind of reached down and put, put them in his pouch. And the next morning when the sun arose, he got to his destination. He looked in his pouch and there were diamonds. And he thought about what the voice had said, that he would, he would be both glad and sorry. He was. He was glad that he had taken some, but sorry that he hadn't taken more. And, and that's the way that it is with all of us. We have opportunities every single day, a lot which we don't avail ourselves of. Uh, and I would just, you know, impart to the students uh, there. Uh, I mean, stop, 
smell the roses, pick up the rocks, try to avail yourself uh, as of many opportunities as, as you can. And, and I promise you, when you get to where you're headed down the road, it, it will come in handy. Well, I think that was a perfect way to end off. That was the perfect way to end off. I appreciate everyone's time tonight. Um, it's been an honor. And like I said, I, I personally mean that every every single one of you guys have uh, played a role in me being where I am. Um, and for a lot of people who are watching this and as they rise to the ranks as well. So um, thank you for who you are, what you do. And uh, we wish you all the best in the future and hope that uh, next time we have this, we can have you all in person. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for having us. Right. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Good seeing y'all. This concludes this year's Thurgood Marshall Symposium. We'd like to thank all the panelists and participants and thank you for being in attendance. Have a good night.